you all need, need to know this uh, list of uh, people who really don't need consent to be treated uh, because we often get into a bind that, well, the we parents aren't here yet. We better wait till they get here. And one of the things that you should know absolutely across the board is that that doesn't matter in that Amtala takes precedence. And Amtala says that you need to do a medical screening exam on this little kid to determine if they're having a hikva defined medical emergency. And if that means that you have to scan this kid's head, you scan this kid's head. If it means that you need to do an ultrasound or blood study or something to that effect, it means that you go ahead and do it. And if you determine that there is an emergency, then you then proceed with the treatment of that emergency. So this kid who bumped his head in the schoolyard now has a, a bleed in his brain and needs neurosurgery. No parents are involved. You can just go ahead and do that. So, so, I, you know, that doesn't mean you don't make attempts to find them and do that kind of thing. But feds say you don't need the parents in these cases. Then there's these other cases where you don't need the parents, cases of child abuse, pregnancy. Uh, sexually transmitted diseases. Kids can get those taken care of without necessarily asking their parents. Substance abuse and some mental health disorders are also in this list of kids who can access their own care under certain circumstances. Then there's the emancipated minors. If you're married, you just got, uh, well, well, I guess you're technically emancipated in one way or the other. Uh, <laughs> If you are working, if you're in the military, then you're an emancipated minor. You don't need your parents' permission for anything. And the third thing here, self-supporting and living on, on own is a reportable case. I don't know if you, any of you have children of this age or not, but that they, they, they never leave. They're over at the door with the suitcase. You know, the idea that uh, self-supporting, living on own, that's a tough one. Uh, you know, the tricks in, in taking care of kids is basically that you never do the exam without the parents in the room so that the parents can be assured that you've done a really careful job on the kids. So the, the, you get the history, that's fine, but then you go through all of those motions, and the motions have words, and it says, you know, the eyes aren't sunken, Ma, I don't see any evidence of dehydration, mouth is wet. Um, ears look good. I uh, don't see any evidence of an infection there. Look at the mouth, my. Look at my show. There's nothing back there, really. I don't see any rash. Child's moving all its extremities well. Sco the skin turgor is really good. Don't think there's any dehydration here. Look at the ch child moves all his joints well. The, the neck is supple. There's no evidence of meningitis, kind of thing. And it's a wow, wow, wow. What a good exam that doctor did. He didn't or she didn't miss anything on that thing. Obviously, you need to have the right equipment, and um, that, that's, that's a no-brainer. Uh, inconsolable crying. This is one that happens all the time in the emergency department. Mom brings the kid. The kid will just not stop crying. Fortunately, when you, uh, most of the time, by the t time the kid gets seen after a two-hour wait in the waiting room and taking out the waiting room, the kids stop crying. But there is a systematic approach to these cases that you need to do to make sure there's nothing serious going on. At the top of the list for inconsolable crying is colic. Um, it has a, f a formal definition. Three hours a day, three days a week, three weeks in a row, that defines minimum uh, colic. I know that some of your children have been colicky. It may last for months. And colic is a risk factor for child abuse. Um, and when that occurs, like shaken baby or something like that, the, most, the, the, the number one suspect for this case in this setting is mother's boyfriend, the mother's boyfriend. So you have, you have to consider that. The kids pull up their legs. It, the implication is it must be hurting in their belly kind of thing. They turn red, and um, there's just nothing much you can do. You find that, oh, if I, I, I walk the child around, that seems to calm the child. We take the child out in the car ride, that, that might help. We put the child on the washing machine, that might help kind of thing. You know, all of these things to um, try to calm the child. We don't know that it's got anything to do with the intestine. So we tried this formula and that formula and this formula and that for formula. Uh, the name is, um, is, implies that there's something wrong with the uh, intestine, but we don't really know that. Anytime there's a lot of ways to take care of something means that we really don't know what the primary problem is. Then the trauma, you're looking for whether there's been any bony injury. Um, so you're feeling all around. Do I feel anything? Is there anything swollen? Do the joints move every... All, all, all over, that's good. Have you ever seen the strangled digit business here where the mother's hair takes out the kid? Let me see a number of hands. Is this weird or what? 
So the mother used to, you know, before this kid was born, mother took care of the hair, a lot of brushing, you know, everything was just fine. And then this kid comes along, very disruptive. There's no sleep. There's no brushing of the hair anymore kind of thing. So the hair says, hey, we need a volunteer. We need to take this kid out. <laughs> Drop down on there and make it, and I would prefer the penis. If the, but, you know, sometimes you miss, you go for the toe. But I would prefer the penis, if you, you don't mind. And they, they make this knot around there, and uh, they strangle it off, and the, the hair is way down there, so you can barely get at it, kind of thing. And the idea is then for them to amputate the penis so there won't be any more kids like this in the world ever again. <laughs> the other thing that, uh, that they say that is on the list is a corneal abrasion. Well, I don't know whether you uh, have ever tried to put fluorescein in a uh, four-week-old. Uh, it is all over everything kind of thing. The kid is screaming. The lids are not about to be open. Thank you very much. And, uh, and the nicest thing that, about this is we have an a article in our database where they put fluorescein into normal kids' eyes, and it's stained. So it wasn't perfect. So the idea here is, is that even if you see something, unless it's pretty obvious, um, what are you going to do about it? The, the latest treatment for this stuff, you're not going to patch this kid's eye. You know, it goes away, gives something for pain. Uh, if now that you and I basically occasionally get these things, we steal the bottle of uh, Optetic. You, the patients can't have that bottle. It's like, oh, very dangerous. It's going to rot your eyeball, but it's in my pocket. Uh, because, we, you know, if they're painful. They, they don't respond very well to uh, things like uh, analgesic, um, oral analgesic. So you take the bottle. There's a great study in our database, actually, where they took proparacaine diluted it by, by a factor of 10 by, by the pharmacist, labeled it, take a couple of drops every three or four hours, worked wonderfully. They compared how much analgesic the patient wound up taking. It wasn't an issue at all. 10 to 1 dilution of proparacaine. That was it. I think that that's where we're moving in this stuff. In any case, we're looking for these sources of pain in a child. So there's some infections. You know an earache can hurt. So maybe that's why the child's crying. You uh, gastroenteritis, you got cramps kind of thing. Maybe that's why it's crying. Meningitis. You know, one of the nicest things about pediatrics is they don't, they don't seem to get sick anymore. They have been immunized against everything. Um, when's the last time you saw a pediatric meningitis case? And if you did, it was probably an unimmunized child. The, uh, meningitis now is uh, the 25-year-old in college who didn't get the meningococcal uh, vaccine so the average age of meningitis went up from, you know, six months to 26 years. And wh whether they have any surgical condition. And the key here is you got to take the diaper off because all this stuff is underneath the diaper. Do they got to have incarcerated hernia? Well, that's underneath the diaper. Do they have a testicular torsion? That's underneath the diaper. Do they have an anal fissure that's just causing them pain? Well, that's underneath the diaper. So you do a thorough job. Kids are, th are totally undressed. You're looking all over the place for uh, things that may be causing pain in this kid. The, the, the most common reason a kid comes back to the hospital at being discharged is, uh, is jaundice. Um, the idea here is that there's a physiologic process going on where the fetal red cells are being lysed, uh, releasing their hemoglobin into the uh, bloodstream. The hemoglobin has to go to the liver, be processed, to be made into bilirubin. Bilirubin goes down the biliary tract, and that's why kids' stools are so, you know, this blackish, greenish color. I mean, that's basically bilirubin. It's a, they're, you're swapping out the fetal red cells for adult red cells. And so one of the problems is, is that the liver is being presented with a huge amount of bilirubin to be, uh, uh, of, of hemoglobin to be processed. And it can't keep up. So the bilirubin uh, is, is being produced, but uh, all of the stuff that needs to be worked on is out there going up into the bloodstream. And so the kids start turning yellow. Mother brings the kid back. You measure the bilirubin in the kid, and the bilirubin's high. But the key thing and when you measure bilirubin is, is it high from the direct portion or the indirect portion? The high, it's supposed to be high for the indirect portion, the portion of bilirubin, the portion of hemoglobin that has not been worked on yet. We can't get to it yet. The liver's kind of busy right now. We'll get to it when we can. So when you measure, the ratio is going to typically show a higher degree of Un unconjugated, indirect, they both use those terms, versus the conjugated or the direct. So the idea here is this is going to resolve. Give the kids a, a bunch of water, 
When is it happening? It happens between day, day two and day four. So this is physiologic. We just can't keep up. Day two to day four, we're talking about five to six milligrams. But you're not necessarily going to remember that. But the concept is what, what's going on here, I think, is, is important. Can, yet, can sepsis cause jaundice? Yes, it can. I'd like to tell you what the physiologic process is that uh, makes that occur. Don't really know. The, but it's so much n better to know why uh, something happens so you can figure it out. This is a very cool one. So everybody's pushing for breastfeeding anymore. The hospitals are not allowed to give you out that formula that, you used to, that they used to send by the truckload to the mothers. No, that's not very, no, no, I don't do that anymore. So everybody's into breastfeeding. In some mothers, when the child is um, on the breast, the child takes in an, uh, an enzyme inhibitor. Glucuronyl transferase is needed by the liver to make unconjugated bilirubin into conjugated bilirubin. Uh, indirect bilirubin into direct bilirubin. So you need gluc uh, glucuronyl um, transferase. If you have an inhib inhibitor for that, then that process doesn't occur. And then you get buildup of all of this bilirubin, that, uh, that, um, uh, this hemoglobin that cannot be converted because you're short on your enzyme kind of thing. And look at these numbers. This happens, the other one happened between day two and day four. This is day 10 to day 21. Bilirubin's through the roof. Look at it, we got a, a 10 to 27 here. For some reason, we're concerned about neurotoxicity, that this, um, this, 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 these chemicals can cause some toxic effect in the brain that may be permanent. So that's one of the reasons we, we, can't, we don't want to deal with high bilirubin. We've got to get it down kind of thing. we we'll put them under the billy light, those uh, kinds of things. Well, it just so happens that in this case, the elevation of bilirubin is not associated with, with cornicterus. And so in some cases, you don't have to stop breastfeeding. So if, you, if you do stop breastfeeding, the numbers will drop precipitously back into the normal range. So there's a little chart there about when you would put a kid underneath the light um, who has um, elevated bilirubin. And that, you know, this is obviously, a, there's a key going on to, to the neonatologist. You're going to get some help on this. You don't necessarily going to do this on your own. But th that's the chart about when they think it ought to be done based on the kid's age and the height of the bilirubin. Screening tests. Here's the, qui here's the quiz question. Um, this is for when our board review is being done, and we say, here, you better know this. So you measure the uh, total bilirubin, and you have it fractionated into the direct and indirect. And uh, the direct and in indirect appear to be about the same. Well, that's not really the way it's supposed to be. The, um, the uh, indirect is the stuff that's accumulating, can't be processed. The direct is going, is, is been conjugated, going out the biliary tree into the, uh, into the duodenum, the small bowel, making the stool blackish green kind of thing. And in this case, the bilirubin uh, ratio is not nor what we normally would expect. We get the, the what if they're both similar? This says there's something wrong with the biliary tree. This says there's something wrong with the ability to get this processed bilirubin out of the liver, out of the biliary tract into the small bowel. So this can be considered part of a potential surgical emergency because of some tract-related obstruction issues. Vomiting in kids, here's the list of things that you have to consider. Yes, you know, vomit, kids vomit or anything. You know, they get hit in the head, they vomit. They get a stomach ache, they vomit. They get an earache, they vomit. It's a very um, kind of, they just are not very thoughtful about the variety of responses that they have to disease. It's a, it's a, hey, let's keep on vomiting. You know, I, I like vomiting. It's a, but the fact is, is that this is the list that, we're, that we can go through. Infections, yes, that might cause a, a somebody to vomit. Hepatobiliary disease could be a cause of vomiting. If, in that case, you would expect the kid to be jaundiced. Malrotation of the gut, that might cause a kid to be vomiting. In that case, what the kids vomit is bile. So if you have a kid who's vomiting bile, that's not kosher. That's not supposed to be happening. This may be in association with malrotation of the gut. So what's coming up can tell you potentially what's wrong with the GI tract here. Uh, pyloric stenosis, we'll go through that separately. Incarcerated hernias, you, need, you know that, but you've got to get that diaper off. Uh, shaken baby, this is the, bo this is the boyfriend again, um, or, or babysitters. One of the things that... Um, 
it's so important to pick your babysitters carefully. Um, you can't, anybody who's got a little bit of a hot temper, they are automatically not your babysitter. In any case, uh, shaken baby has been associated with um, uh, causing vomiting because, you know, the, the brain's getting uh, racked around a little bit. The miracle drug is odantitrine. There's, there's a two versions of it. There's a weight-based and an age-based uh, dosing of the odantitrine. To tell you the truth, there have been studies looking at how, is, is odantitrine the miracle that we once believed that it was? And it's okay, but it's not actually, actually fabulous. Diarrhea in kids. We get into this thing where um, diarrhea, we want to cause, what's, what's the cause of it? It could be diet. Yeah, that may be an issue, but we're concerned about infections. In the wintertime, there are the viral infections, the rotoviral infections and its, and its cousins, and those are mostly gone away, so they, there's an, even one less disease that the kids are going to have. And during summer, kids get diarrhea that maybe tends to be more bacterial. The, the bacterial versions, the staph version. The staph version, we know in terms of its manifestation. This kid had some potato salad, he had some eggs, he had some uh, whipped cream, and within th three or four hours, this kid's got diarrhea. And um, how can that be? It came on so quickly. Staph makes exotoxin. So when you have staph and you ingest staph, you're also ingesting the exotoxin. The exotoxin is what does the job. So you don't have to have a lot of multiplication of your staph to make a big, 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 a much bunch of it because this stuff is the, the staff is really not the, the the problem it's the exotoxin which came with it which is resulting in very on, a sudden onset of diarrhea the uh, bloody diarrhea is the traditionally salmonella and shigella yeah they 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 still exist absolutely i remember seeing a kid who had a high fever shigella is unique in that it part of its pathology is to ha uh, is to provide you with some neurotoxins, neurotoxins. So you get a kid who's got 103 fever with Shigella, it's very common for those kids to seize because there's neurotox it's not just a fever, it's the neurotoxin plus the fever. And so I remember specifically a kid that came in, a febrile seizure, you know, this uh, didn't, didn't look so good, baby, we, uh, we need to do a spinal tap. You get the EMT who takes the kid and bends him into a horseshoe kind of thing. And uh, just as it was, it was done like that, it, it, this guy squirted out the sample we were really looking for. It, it was the bloody diarrhea. He squirted it right out of his butt. <laughs> we continued on with the spinal tap, however. As a total aside, total aside, um, sometimes people get aggressive when they do spinal taps in terms of holding that baby so it doesn't move around. Um, there have been more than one cases of babies having spinal taps. They're, they're draped all over. You got the big EMT who's done, done doing the horseshoe move, who when that spinal tap is over, the baby doesn't move because the baby is dead. Have you, have, have you heard of that, these incidents? Yes, these, these, peop, these babies are just so constrained and made into a U that they basically can, are, can un, cannot breathe they take the gowns off. Would you not just freak if something like that happened to you? So the idea here is not to be particularly aggressive in trying to limit the, these kids from making any possible motion. Um, leading causes of blood in the stool. Um, cow's milk you know, intolerance is on, the, is on the top there. So you, you can experiment a little bit. A lot of time we don't know, honestly. We don't know what the cause is. But it, if the kid looks well, is eating, is happy kind of thing. We don't make a big deal of it kind of thing. If the kid's sick, we might pursue that. Uh, so cow's milk intolerance, so they can get one, another one. Uh, anal fissures. The one that I think is the most wacky of all of these is the idea that this kid is sucking like a Hoover vacuum cleaner on that mother's breast and is causing all kind of cracks to open up and large quantities of blood are being sucked out of the mother's nipples kind of thing which nobody apparently can see, uh, you know, it's a secret kind of thing. And there's so much blood being sucked out of that mother that it causes uh, black stools, bloody stools. It's like, does that make any sense to you? No, it doesn't. So that, that one, we're junk in that one. <laughs> Pyloric stenosis, this is a fun one, basically. This, these are these white boys, uh, northern European kids who have this, they eat, 
vomit aggressively. Eat, vomit aggressively. Nothing's going through, so they're starving. They eat, vomit some more kind of thing. You feel around the belly. You feel the, the, uh, feel the olive there. That's very cool. You made the diagnosis. Get that ultrasound machine done. You've, you're, you're, your part is over. In Japan, they give these kids weeks and weeks of atropine. Uh, here, we do surgery. And this deception is the most common cause of a bowel obstruction in an older child. This is basically when one portion of the bowel invaginates into the other. And where does it occur most often? Where the small bowel meets the large bowel. We would like to ha um, uh, have a lead point be the source of the invagination to occur. Mechosal diverticulum uh, might be one. Um, even things like a, a purpura, a purpura like henox line purpura has been associated with, uh, in, a, uh, in a deception. And when they did that stuff, that rotavirus, di diary, um, those shots or rotavirus, well, they would cause lymphatic hyperplasia of the bowel wall. And as soon as anything pooch pooched up above the level of the normal bowel, little uh, lymphoid hyperplasia there, and that pulled that thing down. So that was basically viewed as the pathophysiology. You had a tube within a tube, generally small bowel into large bowel on a vertically oriented tube on the right side. You can often palpate it. The uh, ultrasound basically shows a, a, ring, a, whole, a ring within a ring, as, as the pathology is. And um, one of the unique things about this, and I don't know if you've ever seen this, but in these kids who have this, they seem to be in a lot of pain. Well, it could make sense why they would have a lot of pain. Um, but, but not only that, not only do they have a lot of pain, they go through these spells where they are totally listless and just lying there kind of thing. And then the next thing you know, they, uh, this pain comes back again. But the characteristic is this intense listlessness that occurs between these spells of pain. All these are uh, basically not diagnoses. Something happened to the baby. The mother runs into the emergency department. My baby's not breathing. My baby turned blue. My baby got stiff. My baby's floppy. It's some kind of condition like that. Um, all these had been thought to be precursors of sudden infant death syndrome. That is really being effectively challenged now. I mean, it, it seemed reasonable. But things that seem reasonable are not always reasonable. So um, there's a great case that says, no, all these did not precede uh, SIDS. In any case, so you might want twi to twist that a little bit there. When a, when a kid has these, you've got to consider the potential causes. And one of the easy ways to kind of go down this list is, if the kid had something at home and, and it is now fine, there's a list of that. And the kid had this spell at home and is now still not fine, still looking sick. Well, obviously, if some spell occurred at home as a result of a CNS infection, this kid is not going to be playing the glockenspiel in the, in the emergency department. This kid is going to still look sick uh, because he has a CNS infection. Um, on the other hand, a kid had a seizure at home, and now the seizure's gone. This kid's looking fine. That helps this, this maybe to help us distinguish what are the causes of this kid's spell? Gastroesophageal reflux, you would generally think, nah, well, nah, forget that. This is the most common cause. They regurgitate ga um, gastric acid onto their vocal cords, causes them to clamp shut. They're turning blue. They're sputtering. They can't breathe. They're struggling like mad because of this stomach acid got onto their vocal cords and caused this horrible uh, reaction. Intracranial hemorrhage. Intracranial hemorrhage is not good. Uh, it, the kid's going to look bad at home, and the kid's going to look bad at the hospital. Botulism. We remember about botulism. If this is a top-down, remember Guy and Bure is bottom-up. This is top-down. So the kid's eyelids are drooping down kind of thing. Um, the, the access to the spores, mother's breasts. Kids under one get no honey. That's nah, just uh, to, to prevent them from getting infantile botulism. They feeble cry. Don't move, you know, they're kind of floppy baby kind of thing, infantile botulism. Airway uh, problems, yeah, if, there is, if you can figure out a cause for an airway problem. I gave you a cause for an airway problem through gastroesophageal reflux. Low sugar, um, why would a kid get low sugar kind of thing? Uh, when we get into a little further on, 9% of kids who have gastroenteritis are hypoglycemic. And we'll, and because basically their liver 
does not have the capacity to store large amounts of gly uh, glycogen, which is then broken down into sugar when they need it. So they're, they don't have much in the bank. So 9%. Do a, do a finger stick, because you, you cannot predict who those 9% are, 10%. So once you find somebody who's got a sugar in the 40, then you've got a kid who has gastroenteritis, uh, um, not eating, and is hypoglycemic. You, got, you have a, a new problem to take care of because the longer kids are hypoglycemic, the more there is the potential for, for permanent injury to their CNS. Sepsis, fine. There is the, that battering again and uh, ODs to consider and Munchausen where the mother makes the kid sick and brings it to the hospital, some su super psychological pathology. And lastly, we don't know. Simple febrile seizures are uh, basically six, to six months to six years, generalized, short. They say five minutes. Five minutes is an eternity. Now, these things are generally like a minute. You've, you've seen them. There's a, they're bilateral kind of thing. The kids recover quickly. They're running around in the apartment, uh, torturing every, uh, uh, everybody there. Uh, there's no residual Todd's paralysis, where after the seizure, they can't move an arm or leg. That's not there. And by definition, you cannot have a pre-existing neurologic condition in a child who has, uh, is being said to have um, a simple febrile seizure. The, th the theory is, is that this is not about how high the temperature gets, but how quickly it gets there. So it went from 100 to 104 in an hour, bam. That's, that's the stressor. Um, so we, we often see kids come in and burn smart. Oh, geez, 104 fever. Put them in the tank. Uh, cool them off. Those kinds of things. They've already gotten to the plateau. The likelihood of, uh, of that kid seizing is very, very, very small. And this is also the reason you really can't prevent febrile seizures because the kid's fine. You, you know, you're not going to give them a, a Tylenol every uh, three hours for the rest of their life kind of thing. So, the, so by the time this spike occurs, Kids seizing, you didn't even know it happened. So this idea of trying to give prophylactically uh, antipyretics, this doesn't work. It, it does run in families, absolutely. So this is one of the reasons not to marry your cousin from Kentucky. <laughs> because, and in fact, sometimes it happens so often in families that the parents aren't freaked by it. Some of the parents are absolutely, my kids, you know, turning into the devil or something. And the other kids, they, 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 they are just used to it because that, that happens in their family. This is a, one of the things we took out of this manual is a whole bunch of references to, get, you better have the doctor see this kid. But we, this is, there's a couple left in here, and this is one of them kind of thing. Uh, the, um, this one, the next one. Complex febrile seizure. Again, you're not allowed to have any pre-existing neurologic condition in this kid. This seizure lasts 15 minutes or more. It stops and restarts, stops and restarts. It can um, uh, be unilateral. Only the right arm and right leg are seizing kind of thing. That is a complex febrile seizure. Needs a workup. Needs a workup. Here's other causes of seizure that are unrelated to, um, to fever. Hypoglycemia. Well, I just mentioned the uh, gastroenteritis. That's a cause of hypoglycemia. Um, stick that, do that finger stick in that little bugger. Low sodium. Uh, where would low sodium come from? It comes from the mother. The mother, water intoxicates her parents because she listens to, to the advice that you gave her. I wasn't going to characterize that advice. About drinking lots of fluids. So we're going to have Johnny drink lots of fluids. It's going to be water. You're going to give lots of water, and they dilute down the sodium down 130, and the kid seizes. This is water intoxication. Anybody in this room seen this happen? Look, at the, look around at the hands. This is not something rare. If you don't think of it, you'll never make the diagnosis. Water intoxication by the mother plops up the bottle. Kid can't get away from it and basically winds up intoxicating himself. Low calcium, I guess it's, we get to, you know, something with the parathyroid gland. Low magnesium, I, don't, I wouldn't know how you get low magnesium. INH is a good one. I was in the Indian Health Service for two years, uh, and everybody in the Indian Health Service has a positive PPD. INH is all over the place. So when we would see little kids seizing, we would know INH, think INH, think INH. It, they respond very poorly to the the um, Valium and those other drugs that were used in that, er that era. It's B6, 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 B6. But if you don't know that, you can give all the uh, Valium and its cousins that you want, and you have a very hard time controlling an INH-induced seizure. Uh, Southeast Asians migrate in. A lot of them, very, 
positive PBD, INH all over the neighborhood. They take grandmas uh, by accident. It's, it's, and uh, obviously, head trauma could be a cause of a non febrile seizure. Dehydration, gastroenteritis, gastro. We want you to use this word uh, technically correctly. Gastro, gastro means uh, stomach. Uh, enteritis means bowel. So this is vomiting and diarrhea, gastroenteritis, vomiting, diarrhea. It's not really an itis necessarily. You know, we have, we're kind of sloppy with that term. Person has osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is not an inflammatory arthritis. We, we just tacked on that itis on there. Uh, we ought not do that. But in any case, here's the reasons kids may not eat. Well, they're sick, they got a virus, and uh, they're, they're vomiting and diarrhea, they got gastroenteritis. But, you know, what about all these painful little sores that they get in their mouth? And that Johnny doesn't want to eat. And diabetic ketoacidosis is absolutely a cause for um, dehydration. The sugar goes up. The sugar basically goes out the kidney. The sugar cannot go out the kidney as powder. It has to take water with it. So the kids become dehydrated. Febrile illnesses, you burn up uh, some of your flu uh, fluids under, the, under that setting. And again, sore throat, ph pharyngitis, not, not swallowing. There, and then there is this intensive list of other things. I don't want to go through this, this picture particularly. I want to go through this. The idea here is to back off on trying to make this an exact science. Just use your judgment. Go down that list and say, these are the things that I know are associated with dehydration. I'm going to make an assessment of whether this kid is not dehydrated, mild, moderate, or severe. I don't care about percentages or any, any, those kinds of things. I'm just going to feel the skin, look at the tears, you know, those kinds of things. When's the last time he peed? Is it, what's the pulse rate going to? And I'm going to make a decision. Ah, I think it's mild. Ah, I think it's moderate. It is very uncommon to have a kid who's got severe dehydration in the United States of America. So I want to do a little bit about, about uh, fluids. The only kid who gets IV fluid supposedly properly is the kid who is severely dehydrated. All the rest get the sippy diet. So says the American Academy of Pediatrics, the CDC, and the World Health Organization. One of the things that we are known for in this country is, in, uh, is prematurely starting IVs in kids who are dehydrated. Uh, it's a painful process. You miss a few times, you know. Okay, let's get the Black & Decker bone thing out because I can't get the IV in. Uh, no, sippy diet, 5 mLs every 5 minutes. What is the success rate of the sippy diet? It has been carefully studied. A meta-analysis showed the success rate is 95%. Throw in a little odansetrine. It, it's going to... Uh, it's going to help you out a little bit there. Check that blood sugar. How much fluids? The, if you want to want to read a good article on this, American Academy of Pediatrics, 2009. Excellent. Uh, uh, oh, no, this is AAFP, 2009 guidelines on fluids. Mild dehydration, 50 mLs per kilo. Moderate, 100. Severe, basically 150, but it's kind of how do you give that 150? But well, you give the first 50 in these 20 ml per kilo boluses. 20, wait 15 minutes, give another 20, wait 15 minutes, maybe wait another 15 minutes, give another 20. So, 50, you know, about 50 of that has been given through the bolus me me um, method. So, 50, mild, moderate, 100, severe, 150, with the uh, three boluses being the uh, way we begin. And what do you give? Normal saline or ring uh, normal saline. Uh, or uh, Ringer's lactate. The, um, this, there's none of this qu quarter normal, half normal. Uh, we go from qu one eighth normal to two thirds normal, then we move up to the, you know, that's a done. Normal saline. The reason I don't like normal saline particularly is all of these kids are calorie deprived. All of them are, are ketotic. All of them are making ketones in their urine. Uh, and so the idea here is the way you fix Calorie de deprivation is you give calories, so a little sugar would be a good, I uh, good idea. How quickly do you do it? Everybody says there's no reason to do it over 24 hours. Just fill up the tank. Four to six hours rehydrating in four, four to six hours. What do you do after that? Basically, full age-appropriate diet. Full age-appropriate diet. There's no brat diet. There's no half-strength formula. These kids need calories. Full age-appropriate diet after you've got them rehydrated. Don't take my word for it. Now, one of the things I wanted to show you is um, uh, um, to, to put in proportion. 
the maintenance fluid for a kid. This is going to be easy to remember too. For the first 10 kilograms of a kid's weight, it's 100 mLs per kilo. That means a one-year-old kid who weighs 10 kilograms, 22 pounds, needs a liter of fluid a day to maintain their hydration. That's why you can see a kid can get dehydrated so quickly because they need all of this. They got a, they've got a fever, their mouths are sore, they're, they're throwing up kind of thing. They don't get their liter. They're, it's easy for them to, to uh, get dehydrated. Let's put that in, in context. What if you had a 220-pound male? Using the same ratio, a 220-pound male would have to drink 10 liters a day as his maintenance fluids, to put that in per perspective. So if that's, it's 100 for the first 10 kilos. It's 50 for the second 10 and 20 for every kilo thereafter. That's it. You have to, all you have to know in pediatric fluids is three numbers. Um, 100, 50, 20 for the maintenance and for the de dehydration. Mild is 50, moderate is 100. Uh, severe is 150. That's it. Uh, little APGAR score stuff, eh, you know, I don't know. Um, neonatal uh, priorities, oh yeah, this is about, you know, th they Brady down. This thing's been blinking, I guess I'm over time here, about 20 or 30 minutes or something like that. But in any case, the pri priorities are clearly Ventilation, stimulation, uh, getting them breathing. It's not about drugs. It's not about uh, CPR. It's about getting them oxygenated. Um, so it's about bag valve mask, maybe a little chest compression. So this is the, the progression. You've all seen it. There's the umbilical vein. That's the big one. There's two arteries. Those are the small ones. And now there are some protocols here. These are blown up to be full size. We're not going to go through these protocols, but they are in your book. To my knowledge, they are the latest ones that are out there. Here's a, a, some, a bunch of pediatric ACLS-related numbers that some of them we've covered uh, before. Pediatric arrests are Brady arrests. They slow down. They stop. This is not VTAC, V-fib. VTAC, V-fib, you would look for some electrolyte disorder. As, uh, and the last thing I want to mention is correctable, correctable causes. Um, these correctable causes are not unique to children. You, have a, you could have a hypovolemic adult who's basically unable to be resuscitated because the tank is empty. You could have a tension pneumothorax in an adult. Listen to, uh, listening uh, to the lungs, is that an issue? You have a cardiac tamponade, distant heart sounds kind of thing. So all of those basically are considered in anybody who's not re re uh, getting resuscitated through the process. We won't go through the drugs. They're there for your reference. Okay.